All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Musr Mondays. We're so excited to be live again and to be teaching to this wonderful group of uh, special people here at the Torch Center, where we get together every Monday night at 7.30, rain or shine, uh, flood or no flood. We're here to learn Torah and to study uh, Musr and how to become the best possible people we can become. So... Last week we discussed the 12th principle of faith taught to us by Maimonides. Uh, and the 12th principle is belief in the coming of Mashiach, the coming of the Messiah. And we discussed many of the details last week. And in the interim, last week I actually read something very, very interesting from one of the uh, great <clears throat> recent sages, Rabbi Avigdor Miller of Blessed Memory, where Rabbi Miller was asked... What's going to be with all the different Hasidic movements uh, when Mashiach comes? Because everyone thinks that their master, their leader, is the Messiah, right? So you have one group that thinks their rabbi is the Messiah, and the other one thinks that their rabbi is the Messiah, and you have another group, they think their rabbi... What's going to happen when Mashiach comes? It says that there's going to be peace among all the people, among all of the Jewish people. There's, everyone's going to, it says that everyone's going to be dancing around Mashiach, and everyone's going to be in equal distance or equal closeness. And the obvious question is, is everyone going to be happy with who Mashiach is? I mean, if it's his rabbi, it's not my rabbi, so I'm not going to accept it, right? And so on and so forth. And if he's Sephardic or if he's Ashkenazic or if he's Moroccan or if he's, you know, whoever he is, if he's from Russia or if he's from Poland or if he's from, from New York or wherever he's from, Someone's not going to be happy. So Rabbi Miller says, I guarantee you, everybody's going to be happy. But that's not going to be the problem. The problem is going to be when they come to pray, what Nusach are they going to pray? When it comes time to pray, are they going to be Ashkenaz, Sfard, Sfardi, right? Are they going to do Ari, uh, the Nusach Ari? Are they, there are many different uh, nusachs, many different versions of the prayer, which one are they going to choose? That's going to be the problem. He says, but that's not even going to be a problem. Because at that time, at the coming of Messiah, there's going to be a Sanhedrin. And that Sanhedrin will be able to decide what was the exact version that the men of the Great Assembly instituted. Because they only instituted one. And as the dispersion uh, happened with Jews moving here and mo moving north and east and west and south, so the different versions took on a new life. That they'll be able to decide. But we ha what, what I want to take out of this is that there will be a time where there won't be any distinction between one kind of Jew and another kind of Jew. It's almost like torch. right? Almost like torch already today. Where we don't see... Uh, uh, affiliation, we don't see membership as being a function in a Jew's identity. What it is, is that we, we've said this a hundred times, maybe a thousand times, ad nauseum, you've heard it from me. There are two types of Jews. There's a growing Jew, and there's a stagnant Jew. And we believe that everyone deserves the right to be a growing Jew. Everyone deserves the right to be a person who has the tools and the capabilities of being a growing Jew versus a stagnant Jew. And uh, no matter what membership someone affiliates with, it really doesn't make a difference if they're a growing Jew and connecting more to the Almighty, that's what counts. And if they're a stagnant Jew, they could be you know, part of the most righteous group on earth, but if you're stagnant, it's worthless. A person needs to be positive that they're not stagnating and rather that they're growing. So, at the times of Mashiach, there will be absolute peace among the Jewish people and there will be peace among the nations of the world. Unbelievable. Imagine that. Imagine there's a time where there's no more war. Imagine there's a time when there's no more strife, there's no more terrorist attacks, there's no more hijackings, there's no more uh, trade wars. There's no... It's peace. Peace across the land. 
Right? That's what's going to come with the, with, with, the, with the arrival of Mashiach. And again, this is something that we believe will happen speedily in our times. Regardless who that Mashiach is, when do they get the reins of, lead, of, of... When do they get the power, the forces, to be able to, to lead the people? So that we said Mashiach is born on Tisha B'Av. He's born on the 9th of Av. And like we mentioned last week, it does not mean that they're physically born that day, but rather the powers of the Mashiach hood is, this, is revealed to them on Tisha B'Av. So they can be born any day of the year. Because think about it, you can make a process of elimination, take, all the, take a database of all the Jewish people who's born on Tisha B'Av, you can figure out between them, you know, who's the, the Messiah. No, they're not actually physically born on that day. But rather, they're, giving, they're given the revelation of their responsibility as Messiah and be on call at all times on the day of Tisha B'Av. Okay? Any questions so far? Anybody? Okay. So, again, the twelfth principle is as follows. I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah. No matter how long it takes, I will await His coming every day. It's a very, very fundamental uh, uh, principle that we have in our faith that we're not just here to be here. We're here there is a light at the end of the tunnel, hopefully in our lifetime. And uh, at that time, there will, be, there will be wondrous things going on in the world. Yes, Dave? I have a question. Sure. It's kind of confusing. Now, we say the world will only be 6,000 years. That's correct. So we promise the Mashiach is going to come before the end of the world? Yes. Yes, Mashiach will be here within the next 230, uh, 200 and, you yeah, might know, not 221 years. Sure. Yeah. You, might not know the, you might know. But what happens, after, what happens to the world after 6,000 years? What happens? That we'll have to wait and see. We don't know. Then. We don't know yet. That was Tom. Um... There's a lot of this is all in Kabbalistic stuff, so let's not let's not get into it. But what happens after six thousand years is that this world will have done its share, and we move on to the next one. You know, when I was living in New York, okay. I went to see Schneerson mm-hmm. and the Lubavitch. They really believe that he will come back. Right. So that was addressed in other classes that we had. Yeah. Um, again, someone who today is no longer alive cannot be the Messiah. Mm-hmm. So that 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 issue has been laid to rest. Uh, pun intended. No, <laughs> but 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 um, but the 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 um, the reality is is that Mashiach will be someone who's alive today, All right? So it, it's very possible he was a righteous man. He was a great person. It's very possible that at if the Jewish people would have been worthy at that time, he would have he would have been. But that's not the reality anymore. So he's not. Okay. Yes. You said that. Person will, they will be told on the on Tisha B'av that they are the Messiah. Right. Who is they that's telling them? No, no, they, they will be told by by the Almighty. God okay, will. The, yes. The person will. The person will. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, it's that, always a man. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But whoever that person is, there's always one per generation. There's always going to be a Mashiach on call. That if God says now is the time, they go. They're on call, but they don't know they're on call. Like no, they God. know that they're on call <clears throat> if God decides that this is the time for his powers oh, well, to be revealed. I didn't realize that. I thought I was going to be it. And... You never know. It might still be you. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I, was, I, I haven't been told I was on call. Well, you wouldn't tell us anyway. You're like a Mossad agent. Right? <laughs> right? They might tell you that maybe, I don't know, I just thought, you know, but really they are. Right? The exactly, yeah. All right, so now we find further evidence about the coming of Mashiach in, in that it says in the Torah, Deuteronomy 19.8 and verse 9, it says that when God enlarges your borders and you shall add three cities of refuge, this is talking about the cities of refuge, when God enlarges your border. And we know that this never took place. 
right? So it is certain that God would not give a commandment in vain. That at that time, you'll add three cities of refuge. We therefore see this will have to take place in the Messianic age. We so do not have to... What? Sorry, is that in addition to the six we have? Yes. Okay. Right? We do not have to bring any proof, however, that the prophets speak of the Messiah, since all their writings are full of this concept, right? So if you look in all the prophets, they're always talking about when the Mashiach comes, right, this and this and that, right? And we see, we see many, many more of those um, throughout any of the writings of the prophets. So the next in, in the Rambam, the Rambam writes in chapter 11, uh, halacha number 3, in the laws of Truva, he writes the following, Do not think the Messiah will have to perform signs and miracles. He will not necessarily change the course of nature, bring, bring the dead back to life, or anything else like that. We thus find that Rabbi Akiva, the greatest sage of the Mishnah, was willing to accept Bar Kosiba as the Messiah, Ben Kosiba as the Messiah, at least until he was killed because of his sons, because of his sins. It was only when he was killed that they realized that they had been wrong. And he was not the true Messiah. Meaning, from what Rabbi Akiva was able to see of him, he was fit to be the Messiah. But when he died because of his sins, it turned out, in retrospect, they were wrong in thinking that he would be appropriate. We see, however, that the sages did not ask him for any sign or miracle. Right? A Messiah doesn't need to prove himself through signs and mir or, or miracles. Now, um, it, it is told that um, one of the great Tanaic sages um, sent his son-in-law, I don't remember the exact name, so I'm not going to say the name if I'm, I'm, I'm unsure, uh, he sent his son-in-law to go verify there was someone that was said about him that he was the Messiah. He was worthy of being the Messiah. So he sent his son-in-law, he says, go check him out. Go to Jerusalem, go check him out. So he goes to Jerusalem, he comes back to his father-in-law, and he says to his father-in-law, he's not the Messiah. So he says, how do you know with such certainty that he's not the Messiah? He says, I saw the way he was sitting. He was sitting, Yoshev Prakdan. He was sitting like, you know, in a very casual way, without having the fear of God upon him, without having the proper, uh, you know, uh, proper dignity. That is someone, someone who's great doesn't sit like that. You know, I, 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 I'm not suggesting anything that my grandfather was the Messiah, but I remember when my grandfather would sit in the summer, and he was, you know, it's during the, the days of Bain Hasmanim, the days between the yeshiva, you know, times that they're in, which is between the 9th of Av and the beginning of Elul, which this year is ready, the first day of Elul is going to be on Sunday. So it's, it's three weeks of vacation, and that was, you know, my grandfather was sort of like off, and my grandfather would sit in a more relaxed uh, environment. I'll tell you how. He'd have a beach chair in his back porch, and he wouldn't lay back. He would lean to the side with the book, with the safer that he was learning, right, on his side, because he can't lay like that. You, it's not, it wasn't, it's not, it's not dignified for someone like that. So you think of someone who's, who's holy and someone who's righteous, it's not dignified for them to lay back like they're on a beach, right? It's sort of like, it's, it's, it's um, contradictory to, to living with the reality of the existence of God present before your eyes. A person, a, at least a God-fearing person, the God, the commandment is the, the, the halacha tells us that we should have the presence of God opposite us at all times. You're sitting like that; it's a little bit uh, counter. Uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it doesn't properly convey that presence. So you have to be humble. Kind of. hum, humility is part of it. Mm -hmm. So they saw that Mashiach, that this person who was alleged to be the Messiah was sitting that way. They said it's impossible. He would have to sit in a more dignified way. He wouldn't be, you know, resting like that, you know, sitting on a beach like he's, uh, you know. There's a certain dignity that comes with it, and he didn't have it. It cannot be him. Imagine, this is a representative of the people. Now, I'll tell you something. I was, we, we speak in, in, our, in our Musar classes about kavod, which means honor dignity. And we don't talk about only honoring other people, but having a self-respect, a self-worth. 
And so we were talking about a person has to know who they are. For imagine, imagine a doctor walks into the doctor's office, not with their, with their overalls or whatever you call them, not the overalls. What do they call them? The uh, scrubs, right? They don't come with their scrubs, but rather they come in a T-shirt and jeans. It, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit so much with, with the doctor, right? It, there's a certain garb that a doctor wears and a, and a nurse Right? There's a certain way that they dress. Same thing, by the way, should be with rabbis. And the same thing should... Imagine you see lahavdil elf not to compare between holy and unholy. But imagine if you see a priest at the street corner, right, with his white collar, with his leg against the wall, reading a paper. Right? You'd be like, this just doesn't sit right, right? Because you think that they, they, they're so, you know, proper... Right? Well, you... Obviously, we, that's, not, that's not our example of what dignified is, but, but the idea is that you have to carry yourself, understand who you are, that, you know, you have to turn the page. I always, I, I give a, a training uh, to rabbis uh, over, over a video conference. Uh, rabbis are in Israel. I do it every year now for many, many years. It's an eight-week series. I explain to them that right now, you are like yeshiva students. But when you go out into the, wherever you're going to be, you're becoming a rabbi. People look to you as a rabbi. You're spo- you're, you have to present yourself in that way. You have to act that way. You, but you have to see yourself in that way as well. Not that you're thinking, oh, how, how, how do I trick people? No, it's not, that's not the idea. Be dignified. It should fit who you really are. Yes? Don't you think, though, in this day and time, we've lost so much dignity as a population. Oh, Everything absolutely. Is so it, relaxed and so it, it's you know, a terrible thing that just for sure like they're going to work in their yard. You know? So yeah. so I spoke yeah. about this. I, know, I spoke I about this in, in a in a particular synagogue without mentioning name or affiliation. We do we have a partnership with eighteen different synagogues around and congregations around Houston. And one in particular, I gave, we spoke about this for several weeks, about honor and dignity, and we gave many, many examples. So the next week, the people were like, you know, tiptoeing at the class, like, what are we going to tell the rabbi? What are we going to tell the rabbi? And they said, you know, our class was, I'm not going to say what day of the week either, because you can do a, an association. So um, they said that the, the rabbi walked in that week in shorts and flip-flops and a T-shirt, it was in the summer, right? And and no, no, it was, it was here in Houston, and it was it was hot, right? And the, the rabbi had come just from Galveston, and he was just you know came straight into services, and the, the question the question is, they, this is what they asked me: like, does the rabbi not understand the dignity that is required as a rabbi for his own congregants, for himself, for his position? For the Almighty, right? There's something. There's something that has to be a certain, you know, a certain presence, a certain way to carry yourself that that's 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 appropriate, right? So it's that's obviously something that Mashiach is such a uh, is going to be such a prominent character, and someone who is so respected and regarded. They'll understand that of themselves too. Here they are as a representative of the Jewish people. Right? Well, another thing, that, just an important thing, if we're already on this topic, we have to understand that just because one may be on vacation doesn't mean God isn't there. Right? God is there too. Whether you're in, in Mexico on vacation or you go to Vegas, oh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas yeah. and God doesn't know what happens. Guess what? We, we mentioned... Uh, way number uh, principle number uh, nine, I believe it was, or principle number ten is that God knows our thoughts and God knows our actions and God knows even if we're out on vacation someplace, right? Right, exactly. And God, God is not limited by only your uh, time zone. Yes. Um, when we were growing up, you know, you would if you went on an airplane. You were dressed up and I wore gloves, okay? I mean, that, that is... Yeah, but you, but you really? dressed to fly, that's right. Yeah. But I never remember my father, may he rest in peace, or any of his contemporaries, 
if they went to the bank, that was a big, you know, you always wore your suit and tie. I never, ever saw anybody in my shul, in, a lady in pants or a man not in a, a suit and tie. I mean, when we were coming up in our, and this is Des Moines, Iowa, okay? Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, Tom will tell you the same thing. I mean, it's, it's incredible how times have changed. That's right. And I think it's a ploy to get people to come to shul. They say, come as you are, no yeah, matter right. what, you know, just come. That's which, I love that concept, to come, but I think to myself what you said many, many, I don't know what class, when, how many years ago, that, you know, when you go before God, when you go in a house of worship, you're going <clears throat> before the Almighty, and is this how you come dressed to talk, right. you know? Look, if, if any of us were invited to go speak in front of a president or in front of the yeah, in front of the Supreme Court, right? Get You'd get dressed up. You'd wear your finest clothes, right? right? Why would it be any different if we go to pray? That's right. But it's become right? such a, a different generation now. That's, 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 that's exactly it's, exa it's exactly that's exactly true. The main thing, however, is that the Messiah will not change our religion in any way. The Torah that we now have with its laws and commandments, will remain the same forever. Nothing will be added to it, nor subtracted from it. So if Mashiach comes and says, guess what? This law is not applicable anymore. You know what you do? Throw them out. If he said, guess what? We're going to add a few laws. Throw them out. The Torah that we have, and where do we see this? We remember, remember uh, principle number nine. Principle number nine was... The Torah that we have today is the Torah that God gave us and He will not change it. And there's not going to be any Torah in its stead. <clears throat> so, if Mashiach suggests the changing of the Torah that we have or the laws that we have now, out. Mm -hmm. Why would He do that? He would never do that. Well, again, generally speaking, the false messiahs, and there have been, sadly, plenty of them, um, it's actually in this week's Torah portion, talking about a false messiah. Right, and it's a it's a beautiful thing when you have the something you learn uh, coincide from something else you learn, like this week's Torah portion. It's a great sign from the Almighty that the Almighty is happy with what we're doing. So you can all pat yourself on the back. I know you could have been watching tonight. What what's on tonight? Is there like some type of uh, MLB uh, no trading? What is it called? The, the uh, no no draft. Is no draft tonight? All right, no draft. No, not cold draft, like draft sports. Oh, yeah. draft. No football draft tonight? You could have been doing a lot of other things and you came here to learn Torah. Call a kavod, right? So either way... What puzzles me a little bit yeah. is the Christians. They know, I mean, they call it the Old Testament. You know, it's our yeah. Bible. Yet it says in there, you should not add to or whatever. Yet they put their New Testament on will well, I mean, if you're going to start, they, how do they define that they, what they're doing is okay? I mean, I, I never can understand that. If we're going to start with the contradictions in Christianity, okay, we're going to need to dedicate like years and years of time. So we're, no, we're going to leave that to them to handle how they deal with the contradictions, which I don't think any of us are really interesting interested in knowing. But uh, um, we're here to study Judaism, which is full of facts and full of proofs and we can ask questions and we only strengthen our faith with our questions and it doesn't get weakened by then they're not allowed to ask questions because it falls apart right as 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 we are well aware of and baruch hashem ashreinu atochakeinu how blessed we are that this is our share the torah that god has given us so you know what you're just saying made me think Many years ago, I went to a young Israel, and they had a rabbi there, and he said, I was brought up, I was a priest, a Catholic priest, mm -hmm. and like you said, every time he asked his bishop or something, they say, you have to have faith. They never would give him an answer. Leap of faith, that's You right. have to have faith. And that's how he, he looked into Judaism, and he eventually became a rabbi. That's right. And, uh, that's right. Because they never would give them an answer. They always would say you have to have faith. That's right. Here's the thing is that when you have truth on your side, you have no fear of asking questions. When you have falsehood on your side, 
everything is it's like a it's like a house of cards. You move the cards, boom, everything falls apart. Yeah. So, all right. We may assume that an individual is the Messiah if he fulfills the following conditions. He must be a ruler from the house of David, immersed in the Torah and its commandments like David, his ancestor. He must also follow both the written and oral Torah, lead all Jews back to the Torah, strengthen the observance of its laws, and fight God's battles. If one fulfills these conditions then we may assume that he is the Messiah. If he does this successfully and then rebuilds the temple it, on its original site and gathers all the dispersed Jews, then we may be certain that he is the Messiah. He will then perfect the entire world and bring all men to serve God in unity. It has thus been predicted in the prophets, I will then give all peoples a pure tongue that they may call in the name of God and all serve him in one manner. All right, so that's all in the Rambam. Now, when you say the house of David, does he have to be a Kohen? No, David, I don't believe, was David a Kohen. David wasn't no. a Kohen. No. 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 Went no. A Kohen. Rabbi, what are the conditions again for uh, he must be a ruler from the house of David, immersed in Torah and its commandments, like David. He also has to follow the written and oral Torah, lead Jews back to the Torah, strengthen the observance of its laws, and fight God's battles. What about the people? What about the people? What do you mean the people? Don't they have to be in a certain... Before he'll come, doesn't there have to be some kind of reverence of all the people? Of the nations you're talking about? Yeah, yeah the nations will, will, will uh, cease... To, to wage war against one another, they will recognize the Jewish people and and our God. How about Ki the Jewish people? Oh, the Jewish people will recognize that that this is this is. Uh, Isn't that what we say in Oleno? That is exactly yeah. what we say in Oleno. That's right. Yeah. I thought he would only come if you if if either we're all pious or. Yeah, well, well, we have to. Yeah, obviously we have to be worthy. Okay. Again, yeah. Mashiach is here. He's walking among us. Mashiach is walking among us. My grandfather would say, Mashiach, holech bar chovot, he's walking the streets right now. Mashiach is, he is, right now. Whether it's in the streets in Jerusalem or any place else, Mashiach is around today. All we need to do is be worthy of it. And once we're worthy, boom. It happens like that in a flash. It says, Ein ben David ba, it says that Mashiach will come, the son of, uh, of David, Messiah, will come when we're not even, we're not, when we're not even ready. Mm. Meaning, wow. not that we're not ready. We'll be ready spiritually, we'll be ready, uh, you know, but it'll be a surprise to us. Like, what? Total shock. We were not expecting this. Yeah. Right? Does, Mashiach, does this person know? Yeah, this person knows that they're the assigned Messiah. God tells them. But they cannot reveal it. No. Till the time of revelation, nobody knows. Do you know if this person lives our amount of years or they live like... Well, again, it goes from, to, from person to person depending on the generation. So if that person passes away, it goes over to someone else. No, I didn't know. If they, or if they become unworthy. I thought maybe the Messiah has been living for hundreds of years. No, 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 no. In every generation, there is a Messiah. All right. Now, in Halacha, in chapter 12, Halacha Aleph, the Halacha 1, do not think that the ways of the world or the laws of the nature will change in the Messianic age. We mentioned this also last time. This is not true. The world will continue as it is. It is true that the prophet Isaiah predicted the wolf shall live with the sheep, the leopard shall lie down with the kid. Right? This, it's funny, as someone was saying, um, uh, you know, it's unbelievable that, uh, you know, I, they went to the zoo and they saw that there was a lion and there was a sheep in the same cage. It's unbelievable, right? It, it must be the times of Messiah because they can be at peace like, like, like it's predicted in Isaiah. So they go to the zookeeper and it's like, this is the time of Messiah, the zookeeper says, no, every day we've got to put a new sheep in there. 
<laughs> so this, however, this, however, is merely an allegory, meaning that the Jews will live safely, even with the wicked nations who are likened to wolves and leopards. Right? We thus find that the prophet says of the nations who will punish Israel, a wolf from the plains shall ravish them, a leopard shall prowl in their cities. It's refer referring to the nations of the world and how they, uh, how they, they treat us so terribly, just like a wolf does and just like a leopard does. So when it's talking about that the, the leopard will, will lie down with a, with a kid and the wolf shall live with the sheep, that's the nations of the world in how they treat the Jewish people. The Jewish people won't be persecuted no more. And the Jewish people, here, my, my, my list, my new list, I love this list, thanks to Rabbi, to Rabbi Ken Spiro, right? So we have this list of, about... It doesn't say something that the lions will eat straw or grass or something? You say that somewhere? Perhaps. Uh, you, Perhaps. you haven't heard that? I'm not familiar. Maybe we'll see it here. Maybe we'll see it here. Right? <clears throat> this is a list of over 250 persecutions the Jewish people experienced in the last 200 years. And, right. And these are not, it's not referring to the Antifada or things like that. This is, you know, this is, this is just like major expulsions, synagogue burnings, massacres, uh, you know. When was the last one? The most recent one was 2000, over here is 2003, in Turkey, Istanbul, uh, two synagogues were bombed, and 23 people killed, and 260 people wounded, right? That's probably the smallest of all of them, right? As early, uh, in, in the 1900s, as early as the 1900s in Prussia, you had mob attacks, you had widespread programs in 1902 in Poland. I mean, you, you go through this, it's unbelievable. Nothing in the last 15 years. I'm what saying, 2003. What about the Harnock Massacre? What about right, right, right. right. This is not talking about Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's, it's not even getting there. Right, that's... We're talking about... We're you're talking about, uh, you know, masses of Jews being... being, being I mean, terrible things. And, uh, Without and, being able to defend themselves. Right, right. Either way, we're, we're, we're living in a, in, a, in a world where we, it's very easy to recognize that we are not uh, as strong as we would like to be. You know, to have six million of our brethren murdered by the hands of the Germans and the Russians, I mean... Where was the whole world? Where, where, where was the world? I, I will say, I will say, and I don't want to get confrontational here. I really don't want to get confrontational, but I remember my brother once said to my grandfather, my grandfather's from Germany, so it could be he was a little prejudiced, maybe, but my grandfather was, my, my brother was saying, you know, maybe we shouldn't buy this and this and that because it was made in Germany. So my grandfather said, America's just as guilty. America's just as guilty. They knew those trains were going to Auschwitz, and they did not bomb those those train tracks. They, right? We turned away votes. We're right. So, so it's not it's not like you know we're we're so righteous here in the United States, and we and we have no hand in this. Either way, let's get back on topic here. All nations will return to the true religion, and will no longer steal or oppress. They uh, they will eat that which they have honestly attained together with Israel. This is what the prophet means when he says the lion shall eat hay, right? That's exactly what he said, like the ox. That's Isaiah 11, 7. Uh, all prophecies such as these regarding the Messiah are allegorical. Only in the Messianic age will we know the meaning of each allegory and what it comes to teach us. Right, what does it mean a lion and what does it mean hay? We'll we'll find out what as soon as this is Rabbi Arya Kaplan and this is his uh, Maimonides principles. Oh, yeah. Well the, we have a copy just of these thirteen principles here as well. Uh, magnificent uh, work compiled by Rabbi Arya Kaplan. Okay, so the next is as follows. It says our sages provided us with an important rule. When they said, there is no difference between this world and the Messianic age, except with regard to our subjection 
to other governments. For the simple meaning, from the simple meaning of a number of prophecies, we see that the Messianic age will begin with the war of Gog and Magog. What is the war, war of Gog and Magog? That is going to be a massive world war, where it says that two thirds of the nation of the world will be destroyed. And uh, let's see what it is. Uh, some people call it Armageddon. Okay. Yeah. We were learning that Rabbi Natan came from Israel from. Um, Breslau. Mm -hmm. And he said the war of Armageddon may not be an actual physical war. It may be a spiritual war. So listen to the next paragraph. Mm. Before this war, Gog, G O G, G -O -G oh, oh, okay. and Magog. 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 M A G. M A G O G. And, and Magog. Before this war of Gog and Magog, a prophet will arise to rectify the Jews and prepare their hearts. The prophet foresaw this when he said, In God's name, Malachi 3.23, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of God. The prophet will not come to make the clean unclean or the unclean clean. He will not declare that certain individuals are illegitimate when they have been assumed to be legitimate. Neither will he legitimize those that are assumed to be illegitimate. His only task will be to bring peace to the world. The prophecy thus concludes, again in Malachi 3.24, He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And this is my bar mitzvah portion. Right? It's Shabbat HaGadol. This is what we read. Others of our sages, however, say that Elijah will come immediately before the Messiah after the war of Gog and Magog. In all cases such as these, no man knows what will happen until the time comes. Uh, these things were purposely left ambiguous by the prophets. Our Talmudic sages likewise did not have any clear tradition in this area and could therefore only come to some conclusion by interpreting various biblical passages. It is for this reason that we find so many opinions regarding these matters. Because again, it's, it's a little bit ambiguous and unclear as to the exact details of when things are going to occur and exactly how they will occur. The main thing to remember, however, is that neither the order in which these things will occur nor the details are fundamentals of our faith. A person should therefore not involve himself in analyzing these traditions. He should not spend time on the Midrashim which were written about such topics, nor consider them overly important. For these things do not bring one to love or fear God. One should likewise not attempt to calculate when the Messiah will come. Our sages thus said, May the soul of those who calculate the end rot. Uh, one must hope and believe in general, as we have explained. And this we said, we don't, we're here, what's the purpose of our existence? To have a relationship and a closeness in our, in, in, with God. And how do we do that? Through the observance of the mitzvahs. And the more we connect with those mitzvahs, the more we get that closeness with the Almighty. And if we say, you know what, that mitzvah isn't my type, that mitzvah isn't my style, what we're doing is we're cutting ourselves off, ourselves off. Right? It says, for example, in certain uh, mitzvahs, that if a person does not observe these mitzvahs, you're cutting yourself, your soul off from the Jewish people. You're cutting yourself off from your connection, your relationship with God. It's not that they're going to cut you off. The Jewish people are going to disconnect. You're disconnecting yourself from your relationship with God. And that's a very, very terrible thing for us to just imagine that by, you know, what is a mitzvah and what is a sin? What is an avera? A mitzvah, we, we translate as being a commandment, a mitzvah, which is a command. Right? God commands us to do. But really, it should be translated as a opportunity, an opportunity. It's an opportunity to become closer to the Almighty. Every mitzvah that we perform is an opportunity to bond and make ourselves closer. Isn't it 
also true every... While every sin comes from the word avera, which means to let it pass. You're, you're, yeah, I'll, I'll forego the opportunity. What do you mean you forego the opportunity? If the goal is to get connected and close to the Almighty, to be God-like, the word Adam, as we mentioned in our Musa classes, right, this morning in the AM class, and in other times we've mentioned that the word Adam, we are called Adam for multiple reasons. One, because we come from the ground, because God took the earth and created Adam. But that's not the main reason. The real reason is because Adam comes from the word Adame, which is to emulate. We are here to emulate the Almighty. We're here to make ourselves become like God. Become God-like. Be like God in every way that you can. How do we become like God? Well, through a mitzvah we become godly. Through a mitzvah, we become less selfish, we become more patient, we become more loving, more kind. All of the positive attributes that the Almighty is in perfection, we add to ourselves through the observance of the mitzvahs. So, if you avoid a negative commandment, is that like a mitzvah? Absolutely. Avoid that's a, a negative commandment means don't do it. So it says, for example, um, not to eat milk and meat together. So if you're driving by uh, McDonald's right down the block here and you say, oh, I'm so hungry. Oh, I want is a, a Happy Meal, right? It's a dollar or three dollars. And you say, you know what? We just learned this in our class. I'm not going to. I'm going to resist. I'm going to overcome the temptation. I'm going to drive down to my pizza or go to Dino's or go to one of the other great kosher restaurants and I'll go buy some kosher food instead. Right? You just observe the mitzvah. Aside from eating kosher, you observe the a mitzvah not transgressing. But the positive commandment is to avoid it. So if you avoid it... No, it's a negative commandment, not... It means it's, it's a do not. Right? That is the commandment. So when you, when you avoid a, the, right. the, e either the temptation or if you're in the temptation, avoid the action, you're observing the mitzvah. You've just made yourself that much closer to the Almighty. You say, well, I didn't really do anything. Well, that's part of it. Right? Yes. Any other question here? All right. Our sages and prophets did not long for the Messianic age in order that they might rule the world and dominate the Gentiles. They did not desire that the nations should honor them or that they should be able to eat, drink, and be merry. They only wanted one thing, and that was to be free to involve themselves in the Torah and its wisdom. That's the purpose. The purpose of the coming of Messiah is not to be rulers over the world. Oh, we'll show the nations. We'll show them how strong. That's not, that's not what it, we're not trying to take revenge. That's not the purpose. The purpose is we just want to serve Hashem. We just want to live a lifestyle that without all of those temptations that are pulling us away. It's without all of those distractions. They wanted nothing to disturb or distract them in order that they should be able to strive and become worthy of life in the world to come. This has already been discussed in my code on repentance, says Maimonides. And now Maimonides finally says, in the Messianic age, there will be neither war nor famine. Jealousy and competition will cease to exist, for all things will be most plentiful, and all sorts of delicacies will be a co as common as dust. Doesn't that seem like we're almost in that era today? Where it seems like, you know, there's unbelievable uh, uh, abundance of delicacies, and everything is so plent plentiful, and jealousy and competition... Yeah, somewhat there is, but it's a lot less than it used to be. You know, we don't have a Cold War going on now. We have, you know, it's uh, everyone wants to be more successful financially and so on and so forth between the other nations, right? The main occupation of humanity will only be to know God. The Jews will therefore become great sages, know many hidden things, and achieve the greatest understanding of God possible for a mortal human being. The prophet thus predicted, The earth shall be full of knowledge, of God, and the waters 
cover the sea, as the waters cover the sea. Just as the water covers the sea, the vastness, so too wisdom will be known to all. Everyone will become so rich in their thinking. They will become so wise. People will be, will be able to understand things that typically are hidden from us. So the purpose of Mashiach, the purpose of, of the coming of Mashiach is not so that we can prove to the nations. It's not so, should we, so that we should become powerful over the nations. But rather, it's so that we can have the ability to serve Hashem without all of the fear, without all of the uh, trepidation from, you know, that will be killed because of Torah study. And as we've mentioned previously, for the Torah study that we're doing right here, right now, if we did that 2,000 years ago, in the open, like we're doing now, you'd be killed for it. We'd be killed at the square. They'd be say, they'd, they'd come gather us up, some Roman, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, gladiator. yeah, gladiator would come, pick us up, throw us in the back of a wagon, take us to the square, and then uh, behead us for what? For studying Torah. We don't want you to be too close to God. We don't want you to be an example to the nations. We want to do whatever we want to do and leave us alone with conscience. Leave us alone with your good deeds. We just want to do what we want to do. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? That's not what the Jewish people are all about. Maybe that's why they hate us so much. Well, a- absolutely, because we have the we have the document. We have the actual manual to maximizing life. Imagine. Imagine if you bought a car, right? You bought a car and a hundred thousand people bought the same exact car that you bought. But you were the only lucky one that has the manual to learn how to turn it on and how to turn it off and how to raise the windows and how to you know, uh, lower the windows and how to remove the roof, right? And you, nobody else knows how to do it. So everyone else is just stuck with a piece of metal and you know how to use it. Imagine, would everyone like you? No, they'd hate you. Why? Because you have the manual. Life is a lot more complicated than using a car. And you know those car manuals are like this thick, right? Just to tell you how to change a light bulb in the car, right? Imagine how to become a better person. How to overcome certain challenges. The Torah gives it to us, right over here. This book is the book that we've been hated for. This Torah that is given to us as a manual. We all have sacrificed right? lives for it. Exactly. Our, our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents were ready to die on the stake for this book, this manual, which shows us how to live our lives. So that's what we want in the coming of Messiah. What we want is that there, no nation should lift up hand against another nation. Yes. But more than just that other nations shouldn't fight, and there should be a proper respect and dignity for the Jewish people, it's that we can serve Hashem without those interruptions. Yes? So Rabbi, so when Mashiach comes, we all go to, to Israel. Potentially. <laughs> now wait, my question is, okay? Are you reserving a first class ticket? Yes. Okay. My question is, do we all just study Torah? Is that what we do? When... Would you want to do anything else? What do you need money for? You have it. It says that the land will be plentiful. You'll, everything will be growing over its, its bound. Imagine you don't have to go to the supermarket again. You don't have to buy anything because it's all free. Why is it free? Because so much abundance. Everyone has everything they need. They don't need there's no competition anymore. The whole thing that we're, we're so accustomed to is not that burden of livelihood is no longer going to be there. Take what we, what we need. You'll have everything you want. Imagine. It's the, the true Everybody. golden age. Everybody, the, the true, world. yes. Well, for sure the Jewish people. Just spread it around. Spread the word. The world, let them be, let them be, let them, let them all be busy with soccer. We can be, we can be involved in, in connecting on a higher level with the Almighty. And the rest of the world is going to stop killing. So I'm not sure. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. They're going to be terrified. Nobody's going to mess with the Jewish people again. Beyond yes. That, when you talk you. about, when you're saying about during the time of Mashiach, when you talk about time, what uh, the Jewish people, uh, what are going to be the sages that educate the rest of the world, can you elaborate on, especially in modern times, the Jewish people? And I say this because there are sects of Judaism which interpret Torah in manners that completely 
are, are, are make, it, make a complete mockery of yes. everything our faith stands for, and yet they call themselves Jews. I'm not talking about Jews for Jesus. I'm talking about I'm talking about certain sects of Judaism that have decided that to go their own way and believe what they want to believe and say and everything flies in the face because they say the Torah is eh, it's it's outdated. It's a story. And, and of course now their grandparents or great grandparents or great great grandparents, you know, again we're 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 you know you know they come from a, from a sort of everybody was religious. But can you expand upon what that means? What it means today, the uh, uh, what we're talking about in the time of Moshiach, in the time of Moshiach, what it means when we're talking about the Jewish people. So Jewish we have to understand. We have to understand like this. I don't believe that there's any Jew who intentionally misinterprets the Torah. The only reason someone would misinterpret the Torah is because they're mistaken. Our sages tell us that in our generation. Because there's so much confusion, we don't even consider them sinners in a way. But rather, we consider them as if they've been kidnapped. They were kidna they are kidnapped in their childhood, in their youth, by secu secular life, by, uh, by uh, you know, what, what uh, is otherwise known as, um, uh, you know, um, uh, what do they call it? They call it, uh, you know, back in the early 1800s, when there was the, the, the whole movement of uh, the enlightenment, uh, the enlightenment or, the, or right? So then there were people who were doing things intentionally, but it's primarily because they didn't know any better. Had they known what Shabbos was, no one, if any human being on planet Earth knew what Shabbos really was, they would never des desecrate the Shabbos. But it's because we don't know what it is. So people desecrated due to lack of knowledge. It's not because they, you know what, I know what Shabbos is, and I don't care. No. It's, they don't know what Shabbos is, and that's why they don't care. They have an experience. So every Jew who was born a Jew, according to what their mother yeah. was going, is therefore going to be part of the, at the time of the Shabbos. Going cor to be, correct. And I, I, I would venture to say that 99.9 .9 people who are of that sect that you're talking about particularly, and in general, of any sect, that is not properly observing the Torah and the mitzvos, 99.9% uh, .9 of the people don't even know any better, including the rabbis. They don't know any better, right? Did they open up a Mishnah? Did they open up a Talmud? Have they ever read through the text of the Torah? Have they ever learned through the Midrash? Have they ever learned through the commentaries? Rashi, Ramban, right? Ibn Ezra, Orachayim, have they ever read through it? 99% haven't. So it's, well, uh, I'm not in the mood, so I'll say that Hanukkah is just a fairy tale. Yeah. I'm not in the mood, so I'll say all this nonsense. But it's not because they really believe it. It's mostly ignorance, and it's very sad, which is one of the reasons we're here. We're here as an organization yeah. because we don't believe that anyone should be deprived of the knowledge of Torah. It says, Torah tziva lanu Moshe. The Torah was given to us through Moshe. Morasha kihilat Yaakov is an inheritance for the Jewish people. It's an inheritance. It doesn't belong to the rabbis. It belongs to the people. It belongs to every single one of us. It's our Torah. We, let's take our stake. Let's take our claim to it. Let's ask the questions. Let's challenge our rabbis. Let's not just say, yeah, the rabbi said, the rabbi knows. No, no, no. Say, let me, I want to see it. But we have to also understand that we're dealing in a generation which doesn't want to know the reasons. Just tell me what to do, Rabbi. Tell me what to do. I don't want to know why. I don't care why. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Well, the more we know why, the more we're able to apply it properly. And, 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 and get closer to it versus just being robotic. So again, there, there's, I don't think there's... It used to be that there were people who ideologically opposed... To, um, to certain principles of the Torah. Today, I don't think there's anybody in any of those aforementioned or lack of aforementioned uh, um, omitted uh, movements that intentionally believes like that. Rabbi, I really don't. Do yes. Really believe that? I really do. I will tell you one second. Okay, think of your congregation that you were a part of, right? Hey, tell me how many of those people know two of the 39 laws of Shabbos. And the one, 
Not t- t- okay, maybe. Okay. The, the other, Maybe fifteen percent. You think fifteen percent know two of them? Yeah. I think you're. I think you're well over exaggerating. Sadly, well, sadly. I wish you were right. How are you going to educate ninety five percent of the people? Torch is here to educate the community. You got the torch, but you go right. to somebody. So we go. That's why. That's exactly why we go to to eighteen different local congregations and learn well, how with many Jews. Torches are there, Rabbi? You're right. You're right. That's why we need torch so much. Here, yeah, yeah. But how, you go to a lot of. The, you think the, the first of all, they don't even believe in the sanctity of the Torah. Second of all, they don't. I, believe but in the here's history. the thing: it may be the movements don't, but the, many of the people. If you ask them, tell me, do you believe the, that the Jewish people receive the Torah at Mount Sinai? They'll say, of course. Well, do you know that your movement doesn't? Like, are you kidding me? Well, if you believe in Torah from Sinai, you don't belong to that movement. Well, it's you know they're confused by that because it's a basic. It's a basic. Here we are discussing these 13 principles of our faith. You, you have these 13 principles, you've got it all, right? And here we have, in our principles, we believe that the Torah that was given to us is the same exact Torah that was given to Moses at Mount Sinai. you got people here that are motivated to come. Right. They want to learn. Well, how are you going to do that to the 95% of the people that don't that don't want to. Again, we uh, we can't force anyone to learn, but we can make it available to them that hopefully they will be intrigued. Yeah. We try to constantly uh, recreate uh, our marketing and our branding so that people will be engaged by it and not intimidated. Many people have been spoken down to about getting involved in, 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 in this this kind of learning. Many people, and you know yeah, exactly what I'm true. talking about. Where From the pulpit, you'll have rabbis who outrightly yes. Will say things that are disparaging right. and, and 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 inflammatory against movements that think differently than they do, and this is called open-minded. Don't forget. Oh, yeah. This is accepting and loving. How many rabbis are like you? I don't know about rabbis being like me. I don't know or that they need to, to be like me. Community and, and do out. Okay, there there are, and we need more. We need more. There's no question. Look, we have sixty thousand. We have sixty thousand Jews in Houston. We need another five hundred rabbis to make a dent. Right? God willing, Hashem will bless us. You win the lottery, and we'll hire more rabbis. Right? All right, my friends. May Mashiach come speedily in our days, so, so that we. So okay. that we can just be focused on the one, one important thing of connecting and learning, learning Torah and connecting with the Almighty. Amen. Have a lovely evening next week at 7.30 Monday night. We are learning the 13th principle. And that is, And that is, I believe, with perfect faith that the dead will be brought back to life when God wills it to happen, the resurrection, uh, and that will be discussed next week. With that, my friends, thank you so much for joining us. Have a magnificent evening. And please like, share, and comment on these videos. We appreciate it. Have a great evening.